The hypoxia-inducible factor, HIF1-alpha, is the master regulator of the cell's response to low oxygen conditions, as Evi Giannakaku from Weill Cornell Medical College in New York explains. HIF1-alpha turns on over probably 150 or 200 genes that promote cell survival, environmental adaptation, and tumors that overexpress HIF1-alpha are much more resistant to radiation therapy and chemotherapy. In uh, 2003, and also the following publication in 2005, we noticed that microtubule inhibitors that either stabilize or depolymerize microtubules inhibit HIF-1-alpha and inhibit HIF transcriptional program. In the current paper, we focused on exactly how this happens. What is the molecular mechanism that leads from microtubule disruption to HIF inhibition? The group's previous studies suggested that microtubule targeting drugs such as Taxol or 2-methoxyestradiol lower HIF1-alpha protein levels by blocking translation of its mRNA. To confirm this, graduate student Marissa Carbonaro performed a series of polyribosome association profiles. By using this assay, you can determine whether a specific mRNA is associated with actively translating polysomes. In untreated cells, the majority of HIF1-alpha associated with the actively translating fractions. However, when you treated with three different types of microtubule targeting drugs, we saw that there was a significant shift, so now HIF1-alpha mRNA was no longer being actively translated. This inhibition was due to the drug's effects on microtubules. When the researchers tested a cell line expressing a taxol-resistant form of beta-tubulin, the microtubule stabilizing drug no longer shifted HIF1-alpha mRNA into the non-translating ribosome fraction and no longer reduced HIF1-alpha protein levels. We hypothesize that the HIF mRNA may be associating with microtubules and that this association is somehow required for it to be actively translated. And so the first thing that we wanted to do was visualize HIF1-alpha mRNA using um, molecular beacons, which specifically label um, your particular mRNA of interest. And when we transfected these molecular beacons into um, MCF7 breast cancer cells, we saw that the HIF molecular beacons showed a microtubule pattern. We did some time-lapse imaging, and we could actually follow the movement of the HIF1-alpha mRNA along the dynamic microtubules. These mRNA movements were restricted when microtubules were depolymerized with 2-methoxyestradiol or stabilized with taxol. Instead, HIF1-alpha mRNA accumulated in large cytoplasmic structures that Carbonaro et al. thought might equate to P-bodies. We noticed that when we treated with any type of microtubule-targeting drug, there was a large increase in the ADS peak in the polysome profile. And when we looked into the literature, we found that this was often correlated with an increase in P-body formation. P-bodies are cytoplasmic granules in which mRNA translation is repressed. Microtubule disruption increased the number of P-bodies in cells, visualized here with a GFP-tagged P-body protein called Argonaut 2. Microtubule disruption also caused HIF1-alpha mRNA to accumulate in P-bodies and associate with Argonaut 2. But stimulating P-body formation by glucose starvation, during which microtubules remain intact, had no such effect on HIF1-alpha mRNA localization or protein expression. P-bodies are hubs for microRNAs as well as the microRNA machinery. So we wondered whether specific microRNAs that target HIF1-alpha were also involved in our mechanism of microtubule-dependent regulation. And so we used the um, Sanger database to identify several microRNAs that were predicted to target the 3' UTR of HIF1-alpha. We found that when you either stabilize or depolymerize the microtubule cytoskeleton, these particular microRNAs also are sequestered in P-bodies along with the HIF1-alpha mRNA. Inhibiting these microRNAs or depleting cells of Argonaut 2 blocked Taxol's ability to suppress HIF1-alpha expression. Yet this microtubule and microRNA-dependent silencing of HIF1-alpha appears to be a reversible process. The reassembly of microtubules after washing out the depolymerizing drug nicotazole was accompanied by a decrease in P-body number, the release of HIF1-alpha mRNA and complementary microRNAs from Argonaut 2, and a restoration of HIF1-alpha translation. It suggests that there must be a cytoskeletal sensor in the cell 
that following macular tubal disruption leads to the increase in peak body number and sequestration of HIF message and HIF targeting microRNAs onto those peak bodies that leads to the translational suppression of HIF. Many solid tumours overexpress HIF1-alpha and depend on it for their growth and survival, while many microtubule inhibitors are already used as anti-cancer agents. Might they be affecting tumour growth by targeting this HIF1-alpha pathway? We believe that the clinical activity of microtubule targeting drugs is dictated not only by their effects on microtubules and mitosis, but by their effects on microtubules and the downstream signaling pathways that these regulate. HIF translation is one such example. A very important question is what other messages are regulated in a similar way. Identification of these mRNAs will help us better understand uh, how this class of drugs works in clinical oncology and why it does not work in certain cases. And the other aspect is to identify the signal of the proteins that take HIF mRNA following microtubule disruption and target it to P bodies. And we have a couple of leads that we're looking into. Identification of any of these proteins could lead to the generation of a new therapeutic target. Meanwhile, you can read more about the microtubule dependent regulation of HIF1 alpha expression in the paper by Carbonaro et al., published in the January 10th, 2011 edition of the Journal of Cell Biology.